We near the close of Holy Week, when more than a billion Christians around the world remember the crucifixion of Jesus on this Good Friday. Sunday is the pinnacle of Christianity, Easter, when the Bible says the stone was rolled away from the tomb and out of the shadows was born an eternity of faith for believers. It's at this time that we bring you a very special and incredible story of a West Michigan man, his family, friends, and strangers brought together by tragedy, remarkable faith, and they say divine miracle. Here's Casey Jones. Marley, the idea of faith in, is, is believing in something that you may never see. But what if that belief gave you a window to see that faith firsthand, only to find out that sight is such a small part of it, that perhaps it's not seeing is believing, but rather feeling? This young man, his family, friends, and complete strangers found themselves twisted in prayer, hope, and faith. Faith made stronger in the fall. The essence of the meaning of prayer is conscious contact with God. I think a stream of light between God and me, moving back and forth, it's energy, you know. From the hole, there was this light that came down. Just from the debris and the dust, you could see there's just light that shined right on him. It gave us a little bit of hope. It gave me a little bit of hope. Without hope, there is no future. Hope is that light in any darkness. This dude literally jumped up there and is down. Seth definitely was the more adventurous type. Dude, Seth, are you all right? Don't you tell me that it wasn't meant to be. I'm just out filming and skating around. Go to destiny. I remember we were both home. It's like one yeah, of the warmest days. It's been in a while. And he left the house and very excited because they were going to go shoot this video. We just jumped on this. There was a block sitting right here, and we just jumped on the roof and then crawled up. About 7 o'clock, I heard a, just a frantic knock on the door. Went along top and got on the third story. And just quickly in your mind, you go through everybody's home. And a big crash. And Seth is gone, but he took his car, so he has his keys. Seth was in here. So that's when we were trying to get in there. And then I opened the door, and it was the police officer. We couldn't see him, so we ended up having to bust a window over there. And it just felt like the movies, you know? <laughs> like, you just knew instantly that something wasn't right. We jumped the roof, literally fell 14 no. feet. No. And the first thing she said was Seth Alfaro had a bad accident. Seth was born breech. Um, what do they call that? Um, Franklin. Franklin. So his butt that means first. His butt first. <laughs> and so we said, that's Seth, you know? So we should have known right then and there what we were in for. If anything, before Seth was even born, the Alfaros knew faith. They knew it was gold, tested by fire. We were married in December of 1988, so that's 28 years. And we had our first son 10 months later, <laughs> which was one month too long for me. By the time they'd shaped their healthy family of seven, Chris and Chris had lost four babies, a stillborn and three others to a genetic kidney disease, none living more than three days. Always our faith. That was always our foundation. But even Golden Faith couldn't prepare the tested couple for their second son, Seth Thomas. We learned a lesson in humility when Seth was born because <laughs> Michael and Andrea were always just really, really well behaved and I thought I was a really good mother. And <laughs> I would kind of look at those other mothers in the store with their screaming kids and you know, be a little judgmental in my own mind. And then Seth was born. <laughs> He used to take naps in the afternoon. He was the one that'd go to bed really nice and then wake up just like, like a demon child. <laughs> he dreaded when he, he dreaded was going to wake, wake up. up. Yeah. Neither realizing that years later, that would be all they'd want. And Seth's always been like, you know, the big go-getter. He's been the, the black sheep of seven. <laughs> <laughs> Thought that gets a nostalgic laugh from the siblings. Seth is the wild card. Yeah. yeah, probably more than the others. Goofball, the <laughs> the one who always has to be doing something. He fits in in a weird, perfect way. Mm -hmm. Life is exciting, and if you're not having a good time, then what the heck are you doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's Seth. <laughs> Seth's zest for life was clear through his music. 
a musician who craved the spotlight and dreamt of celebrity. It was that passion, not just the word, but a way of life, tattooed on his arm, that brought him downtown on a Monday night, February 13th. The sun was setting over there, and we kind of wanted to see the sunset. It was a regular Monday night for a group of 20-somethings. They'd just finished shooting this video. That wild card wanted a wild view of his city before darkness would overtake it all. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Then Seth was like, I want to get on the roof. You were on the corner here? Yeah, so we went, jump this here, climb this roof, and then we climbed this pole up to this roof up here. And that's when me and Seth were up there. That's probably, I don't know, 25 feet close to that. It was only eight feet from one roof to the other. The sun had set. It was time for the go-getter to get going. It's such a far fall, too. It's so far up there. I don't think he stopped, right, the roof? It just, it just gave completely, and it didn't stop him at all, did it? Yep. He poked right through it. Kind of bounced off the furnace on the way down, slid off the furnace, and kind of probably slowed his fall a little bit, helped him fall sideways. The video Jump is graphic. His friends go. expected the daredevil to get up and walk out. Oh, and after about 20, 30 seconds, it was like, OK, this is, like, this is real. You know, like, we need to get in there and, and, and save our friend. Yeah. The only way in was to bust a window out. They found Seth on the only slab of open concrete in a parts room. Sharp, rusty metal inches from him on either side. He was completely unconscious, um, you know, making, you know, some definitely terrifying sounds. I called 911 and told us to do compressions on him. I was doing that. He was, he was kind of snoring. He was, like, making kind of a snoring noise. And we told the, you know, the, the lady on the phone, and she was like, that, that means he's not breathing. You need to do chest compressions. No one should ever be able to see their friend the way we saw Seth that night. All right. You know, bleeding out, and it was, it was not a pretty sight. Coming up, a race to save a 21-year-old's life. They did a CAT scan of the brain, and there was bleeding in the brain. You know, and then he asked us, do you have any questions? And I said, could he die from this? And he said, yes, he could. Back. Seth Alfaro was any 21-year-old man, curious of the world, pushing its limits. Ultimately, it was that curiosity that led him into the back of a speeding ambulance headed for Spectrum's ER. Friends left to sift through dust, flickering in the light of a hole left behind. Parents, by police escort, rushed to the hospital, all while a young man prepared for the journey of his life as he inched closer to death. It was a journey he would not take alone. And so I was hugging Peter, our nine-year-old, and he said, he said, it's okay, Mom, because really life is about getting to heaven, so it's okay. And my first thought was, I mean, I knew he was right, but my first thought was, then just take me right now, God, because I can't do it anymore. It's too painful. I just, I can't, I'm done. I'm, it hurts too much. In the doors of the Alfaro home, two things are abundantly present, faith and family. In this moment, Chris is at her lowest. Her 21-year-old boy lay lifeless in a cold, dark hospital bed. The total darkness to reduce any sensory sensitivity. The cold to break his dangerously rising temperature. Seth's brain was swelling. He was in a coma. And I said, could he die from this? And he said, yes, he could. It'd be up to Seth what happens the next 24 hours. And they said, well, no, in the next 24 hours, if he's going to make it or not. With a metal bolt drilled into the back of his head to track the pressure, those 24 hours crept to three days. Doctors tried to wake him from his coma. Seth showed no signs of life. For three weeks, the rhythm of his parents' lives would rise and fall with the sounds and numbers of machines. They said, well, actually, the peak swelling of the brain is three to five days. And we got through that. And then they're like, well, it really can go five to seven days. It was a constant game of wait and see. Is it the sedation or is it the brain injury? And nobody could say. Then, 10 days in, hope. Seth wiggled his thumb. We had moments. That hope quickly cast over by the shadow of devastating results. They did the MRI before he was awake. And the MRI was not good at all. 
so you can see some of the blood in there. And Dr. Sam Ho is the chief of staff at Mary Freebed. Generally, this type of injury bears very poor prognosis. He's been practicing spinal cord injuries since 1983. The shearing injury, they usually don't recover as well. He doesn't need to say but, much. Yeah, to the shearing or shredding of the brain, the white blood marks all over Seth's MRI paint a grim picture. You can see over here, some of them tiny little speck in there. You can see right there and the other side too. I remember for me, it was, um, all I've ever wanted is to be a wife and a mother. And having kids is like so joyful to me. And I remember we talked to the kids and we said, um, your, you know, your dignity isn't in what you can do. It's who you are. So and we said, it's the same Seth. No matter what he can do, or how he comes home, it's the same Seth. What happened next can only be chalked up to faith. Faith that a doctor had in a family, that a family had in a son, that a son had in life. I always believed that my patient and I crossed paths. There's a reason. Dr. Ho and took a chance. Based on a conversation with Seth's dad, he moved Seth from Spectrum to Mary Freebed. And sometimes the outcome surprise you. Somebody up there make all the decision, do everything for us. He can't say why specifically he took what looked like a hopeless case. One of my peers asked me, like, why did you take him? He calls it a gut instinct. Others might call it faith. Faith is everything, isn't it? I mean, faith is everything. I mean, you cross the street here on Fulton, and you believe that the car who is coming and slowing down, sees the red light, and won't go through. You don't know that, but you have to act on faith that they will. It's woven into the mundane, according to St. Thomas Pastor Jim Chelich. For him, it's the fabric of life. It's the opening of our minds and our hearts to a possibility and a receiving it. You know, many people think it's, it's, it's this long, tiresome intellectual exercise of thinking through whether propositions are accurate or inaccurate, right or wrong, and it's not. The object of faith is, is presence and, and person, you know? And Christian faith is the kind of center of that objective is Christ as a presence, you know, and a power and a power there at every moment. The O'Farrows found their faith stretching in God, in their son, and now in Dr. Ho. Somebody up there, <laughs> they do all the work. And that's, you know, this type of injury based on MRI, outcome is bad, but it tells you, you can't always based on that. Patients have tremendous ability to heal. You give them a chance, they will heal. The healing for Seth didn't come right away. For three weeks, he hung on a thread of life. His parents, typically private, turned to Aunt Kathy. They needed her to rally the prayer warriors. You know, if we don't put it out there, how are people gonna know what to pray for or even pray for him? From day three, Kathy turned to Facebook. One post after another. Details of the struggles. Day six, he had pneumonia. The devastation following the MRI. Seth's little steps. He was off oxygen. The Alfaro started to notice a trend. They'd share a need for a prayer, and that hurdle would be jumped. What happened with Facebook is, is a miracle of itself, and a miracle and a testament of the love of people. A lot of people for someone they didn't even know. Mm -hmm. People who didn't even know us didn't know Seth. People from Spain, from Italy, from New Zealand. The Alfaros were surrounded in love, wrapped in prayer when they needed its comfort. I was having a really difficult time at that point saying, okay, Lord, your will, your way, your time. I, I couldn't figure out what he was doing or why it was going this way. And this woman had this vision of all these people praying in Seth's hospital room. And we, and her comment was... A dream vision I had last night around 3 a.m and had this vivid movie-like picture of hundreds and hundreds of people streaming into Seth's hospital room in the Adoration Chapel, praying on their knees for Seth. 
Our Father is listening and loving. As you say, the waiting is hard, yet he is healing Seth in the waiting. She said, God is healing him in the waiting. And then you fast forward a few weeks down the road when Seth can talk, and he tells us that while he was in his coma, he saw hundreds of people in his hospital room praying for him. So many people that it was spilled out into five other rooms full of people, people he didn't even know, praying for him. A twist in the recovery. When we come back, our special continues. I saw it was hundreds and hundreds of people on their knees. Like I can't even, it's like you can see each one, but you can't because it's so, it's like a myriad of, of people. And for the first time. But I saw everyone who was praying for me, not like their faces specifically, but like the crowds of people praying for me. Welcome back. Seth Alfaro was alive, but the journey ahead of him was a slate of uncertainty. Doctors feared that he may be severely impaired for the remainder of his life. But from the moment Seth opened his eyes from complete darkness, the people around him knew he had done more than just wake up. He had come back from the depths of our world with a new purpose and a renewed faith in the fall. And he had quite the story to tell. He gave him four blocks with his letters of his name and said, can you put those in order to spell your name? And he batted them around the table like he didn't know what it even meant. A heart-wrenching feeling as that shadow lurked over the hope. But two days later in speech, he took the pen and he was writing full adult sentences. And one of the first things he wrote was, my God is good. And this is a 21-year-old kid who was out skateboarding and woke up in a hospital unable to walk, talk, eat, swallow, um, and he's writing, my God is good. From that point on, he was frantic to try to tell us something, but he couldn't talk. His vocal cords were too weak, and his inability to communicate grew his frustration. So the Alferos turned to Kathy. She again turned to Facebook, and days later... It was just a whirlwind for the next probably two or three days every time he talked it was you know he told us right away that he had never begged or pleaded for anything so much in his life that he had heard God and felt his love he told us right away that he saw himself laying there on the machines he saw all the people praying for him people crying for him, um, and that that was what brought him back. He said he was really low, and it would have been so easy to just fade away and die. If I wanted to die, I could have died. And it's, it's so easy to die. It's like when you're really tired and you could fall asleep, it's that easy to, it's that easy to die. But I saw everyone who was praying for me Prayer is, does so much more than you could ever imagine. And that's what gave him the strength to come back, and that's what gave him the strength to fight. it. He saw it, felt it, the energy, the light, the hope. Seth, before the accident, was always looking out for himself. It was shallow. You couldn't have a heart-to-heart -heart and really, really talk about the faith. Now it's like, I really, I want to talk about the faith. I want to become closer to God. So, it's just that want. God's really blessed me. I even think back when I was in the hospital bed, when I couldn't even walk, when I was learning how to swallow, just the peace that God gave me and the patience that he gave me. And so I see that and I know that that came from God and I want more of that. So where do I go? I go to God to get that. Did you make a, a conscious decision? I want to go back. Not a conscious decision, I want to go back, but that's what gave me the strength to keep fighting. Because it would have been so easy to die. That would have been the easier route. But it's all the people that were praying for me, 
gave me the strength to keep fighting, to live. I remember begging God for two more minutes, for 30 more seconds. Seth saw exactly what Amy Oatley saw in her dream, that stream of people praying for him. God takes mistakes. He takes things in our lives, crooked lines, and writes straight with them. And um, so it is, is it a surprise? No, but I truly believe it's a miracle. You know, I can't explain it. You just see it. Almost like a, a perspective that the human can't even understand. It's almost like you were above it, or? Yeah, almost like above it and like a bird's eye kind of view. But you could see and hear and feel. Yeah, that's the most important. I could feel it. When people were praying for me, I could feel it. I didn't feel pain. I could feel, you know, when people were too tired or they didn't want to pray and they didn't feel like praying, that's not that important. When people wouldn't pray, that's what hurt. When they were too tired and they didn't, they didn't want to take a little bit, two seconds to pray. I could feel that and that hurt so bad. You could feel everything. It's like, it's more, more of like a, it's less of a words and just more like a feeling. Like you, could, you could feel it, like really feel it, everything. The love, God, God's love. Is, is amazing. It's still clear from his siblings' account, Seth is the wild card. He's the go-getter, the one who fits in in his weird, perfect way. But make no mistake, when Seth came back with that same goofy humor he had before, he was different. There was something deeper. You fall 26 feet, and not only do you not break a bone in your body, but you didn't even crack your cell phone. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Got some brain injury, but the phone's fine. <laughs> Priority. <laughs> but you say that jokingly because your priorities are different now. Yeah. My, a lot of my priority used to be social media. How many likes something got that turned on how the self-worth. And that's not where it is. My self-worth comes from being a son of God. Truly. You know, I saw all those times that I doubted God, and yet he was answering the greatest prayer of my heart for Seth, for any of my children, is for them to know him and to completely give their lives to him. You hear people say it's all in God's time. It's so true. And I think, again, it comes back to, you know, gold is tested in fire, you know? It, our faith is our is that gold, you know, we gotta cling to it. Just like that. At the heart of any belief, every person falls. Faith is not made by picking yourself up. It's made in choosing which way you walk when you're back on your feet. Out of everything dark and, and negative that was there, there's a light shining on Seth. No, it's good. Seth Alfaro fell 26 feet. It gave us a little bit of hope. It gave me a little bit of hope. He's back on his feet, walking towards that light his direct connection between him and God. Or is there ever a day where you wish you could go back to the day of the accident and not jump from that roof? No, because the way that God's blessed me through this whole thing, experiences, and just the person that I am now, I don't think I would have changed like that. And it's quickly, you know, it is hard going through some of this stuff. It is, there's no other way to put it but it's God's will. And that's, what we, and that's what I try to remind myself. I'd rather be doing his will than my own. You know, talking with his friends who were there that day, they say, looking back, nothing about that day was odd. That uh, climbing that roof, falling through the roof. And you could chalk it up to whatever it is you want to believe in for this recovery. Right. But the bottom line is, Marley, talking with his doctor at Murray Freebed, Dr. Ho, he said they wanted to have him there for up to 10 weeks. Seth left in four. Oh he, my. He, he just, every day he progressed and recovered exponentially and the doctors couldn't keep up with him. Casey, I lost count of how many times I got chills during that story. You just gave me another one. I mean, that is amazing. Just how much he's been through. He's up and talking with you right now, but doesn't he have, what, does he have more? 
recovery rehab to go through? He's not there yet. He knows that. He knows he's not there yet. Dr. Ho is saying right now they don't know what his limit is. He is continuing this way up. He has not plateaued yet. Uh, they don't know if he'll plateau. Does so he have bigger plans then still for making going back and finishing that video they were making? I, I think I think his plans have changed. I think that he hopes to still inspire people, but n maybe not on the level that he did before his fall. He wants to inspire people in a different way, but it certainly has not changed the impact that he wants to have on people. And uh, Amazing young man. And you can talk more with Casey. He'll be on Facebook Live right after this show. We'll see you tonight at 10 and 11.